The next one is about critical thinking. So almost 40 years ago, President Ronald Reagan delivered a report known as the Nation at Risk that stated from 1963 to 1980, SAT scores had been declining in the United States. The report blamed teachers for the decline and called for a commission to assess the quality of teaching and learning at the primary, secondary, and post-secondary levels. Uh, one of the authors, James J. Harvey, wrote the now famous quote, Our educational foundations of our society are presently being eroded by a rising tide of mediocrity that threatens our very future as a nation and a people. If an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might as well have viewed it as an act of war. This is the actual quote, an act of war. Very, very strong words. But here's the problem. This words, these words sound so convincing. It feels like, wow, that's really bad. He's totally right. You know, things are worse. And it was factual that SAT scores had declined. It, like, however, the report itself, it was so profound. Like, it fundamentally changed education in the United States. But it was flawed to begin with. While it was true that SAT scores were declining during that time, much of the decline was just due to lower income students also taking up the SAT exams when they would never actually do it. So the Department of Energy brought in their best statisticians from Sandia Laboratory Systems. Um, they brought in their system scientists who looked at the average SAT scores among different income brackets. And they found that SAT scores had increased in every income bracket between the periods of 1963 and 1980. So this is the problem is the scores were actually increasing for every income bracket. But if you took them all together, then the, the actual score was lower overall. Um, I believe this is called the Simpsons paradox um, in the book. But without going into too much detail, it's our lack of critical thinking that caused this assumption that things were really bad. So I think that that's, that's the way I see things is, is really, it's really concerning. So numbers are often used to demonstrate that decisions are made based on facts. They're objective and they shouldn't be questioned. But without the ability to critically think about the numbers, most of the population will just believe what numbers are given to them. And they won't think to question those numbers. And this is why the poorest and most vulnerable are most at risk of being left behind by systems like AI. We need data transparency and the right to ask how these mathematical decisions are made. Uh, another example, let's go back to that example of, uh, with teachers. Teachers in Texas were evaluated using a WMD known as the value added model. It looks at students' past test scores to predict their, the, the same students' future test scores. So if they're progressing on this path, they should, be, they should be getting these types of grades in the future. And the results were assumed. Um, so basically, they, they would predict where they would go. And if, if it varied, the, the variation in that result was assumed to be the result of the teacher and the school. Uh, rather than, say, the students' abilities or their family's socioeconomic status. Like, all of these very, very important factors completely ignored in the system, again, because there's, there isn't a lot of critical thinking when it comes to these uh, WMDs. Um, uh, the example that I loved from the book was a Texas primary teacher was embarrassed about his 2 out of 100 score. He was too embarrassed to share it with his colleagues until he he was in the like in the lunchroom and he, he overheard 
uh, others had received the same score. Now, for him, um, his tenure and, and his relationships that were built over time had saved him. Uh, but this WMD has real implications when decisions were made to fire the bottom 2% of all teachers each year. So a good teacher in a poor neighborhood would become collateral damage uh, of this weapon of math, math destruction. You know, the interesting things, uh, the story about this uh, teacher was that, ironically, the following year, the same teacher that got 2 out of 100 got 94 out of 100 score uh, simply by teaching a class of regular students. You see, what happened was um, he concluded that the poor score on the first year was due to his work with special educational need or SEN students. And uh, he also worked with gifted and talented education or GATE students. Uh, so the SEN students had slower progress during the year and the GATE students were already scoring really high. So they're going to make less progress as well. So they're, they're expected to go really fast, but they're, they're going really slow, uh, slower than average. Um, and that was blamed on the teacher. And so you can see like this, this, it screwed it up. And uh, I think to, uh, to Alice, yeah, like, I, I thought the same way. I was like, wow, really? This this happens too? Absolutely. <laughs> it does, 100%. Um, so handling exceptions, it remains something that we need to rely on people to do. Uh, this is what makes weapons of math destruction so dangerous for our society. It's not just stripping away reality from the model but it's also stripping away our humanity from the model as well. Like if this were in a real world scenario, you could speak to somebody and you could say like, come on, like this doesn't, this isn't reasonable. Look at my situation. Of course, this is going to make less progress. And you can't fire me because of this. But often they, people don't have those types of insights. They don't get that type of understanding. So how, how do we fight back? 